course, in his weekly spot, joining us each and every week here on Middays with Q on 97.3 ESPN. Steve Gardner from USA Today joining us on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Steve, how are you doing today? Good, Josh. How are you? Doing well. So I obviously got to start with F1. I mean, talk about a guy who just got hot for a month. It's not every day that you get a guy who gets five starts in a month because, you know, sometimes the calendars don't line up properly. But he didn't just get five starts. He goes 5-0, and 176 ERA for the month. Only six walks in 30 and two-third innings, Steve. I mean, talk about a guy who took advantage of an opportunity and just locked down the Yankees last night. Yeah, it's amazing. And in that hot streak, you look at the teams that he's pitched against, too. Not only the Yankees, but the Nationals, uh, the Brewers twice, and the Cubs. So he's not feasting on the uh, you know the dregs of the National League or, or uh, the American League. He's faced some tough teams and allowed – a total of zero home runs over those five starts. Yeah, I'd say that's a dominant stretch. What have you seen from him that has really stood out to you, how he's getting this done? I, I, you know, one is, is avoiding the home run. I think that's one of the things, especially in the game today, when you've got so many guys that are capable of hitting the ball out of the ballpark. Um, of course, he's not going to be able to do that throughout the rest of the season at this particular rate. But still, limiting hard contact, not walking batters, and uh, and basically just being around the strike zone. I think that's really the key. He he's he's not really overpowering really uh, to that to any degree. I mean, he's got a nice nice fastball and you know gets up to the mid nineties. But still, it, it's just um, it's one of those things where everything comes together. And I think part of it too, Josh, is confidence. Where you get one game. You pitch another good game on top of that. You pitch another one on top of that. Uh, I think it breeds success. And uh, so far we've seen great results. Certainly I'm sure he's going to be sad to see the month of June come to an end. (laughs) You know, it's interesting because this is a guy who's a former first-round pick in the baseball draft. He was involved in two different trades for much bigger names, and he was almost felt like a throw-in in those deals. You know, the deal from the Padres with the Dodgers that involved Matt Kemp, and then back in 2014, the deal with... Jimmy Rollins, so he got moved around real quick at one point, and he seemed to have found a place here in the Philadelphia system. Yep, and um, that's just a testament to, number one, the Phillies for identifying him, you know, in the Dodgers system and getting him in that Jimmy Rollins deal, and, you know, their patience. They've they've done a pretty good job. You know, he, he was in the minors for a little bit this year, and, and last year, even though he saw some time with the Phillies, so it's being patient. Last year, during the regular season, in uh, his 11 starts, ERA was over six. But yet they stuck with him. He's gotten a chance now to prove himself. And now he, he looks like the uh, the Phillies' most reliable starter. It's interesting you mention that because you look at the Phillies' starting rotation right now. And, of course, we can only state as of June 28th. But you could argue that the three best pitchers on this team, obviously Aaron Nola, but then Nick Pavetta, and Eflin, and that Arietta is not even in the conversation right now as one of the team's three most, not just best pitchers right now, but most reliable, because he has not been reliable at all. No, he hasn't, and um, something's got to give. I mean, he's he's got to get back on track and uh, find a way to, you know, uh, get back to where the, the success that he had earlier in the season. Um, we can't we can't blame it on the the layoff before signing or anything like that. Um, as you know, it, it's easy to do with some of the other pitchers that have struggled that didn't get signed until late. Um, this is a case where you know he needs to to find whatever it is that uh, that he's been missing. But you know, the last five starts, zero wins and uh, ERA just shooting up. I've been asking a bunch of people, different people this week, this question on and off the air, and I want to get your insight. Do you think Vince Velasquez is a long-term, a starting pitcher or a bullpen pitcher? I'll tell you what, I, I think from his skills, you know, with a really good fastball and ability to strike batters out, I think he'd be a heck of a closer to tell you the truth. Um, So, but still, He's he's of the age now at 26 where 
you know that there's talent there. We've seen flashes of that, big games that he's had where he's just looked overpowering, and you wonder why he can't do that all the time. And I think, that, you know, again, it comes back to command, being able to, uh, to, to throw your, your pitches, all of your pitches, where you need them. And um, those, you know, those blow-up starts, I think, is what really makes it difficult to see him sticking in the rotation. Um, long term that, that maybe moving him to the bullpen might be a better thing to do for him. Um, the question is, you know, obviously starters are much more valuable than relievers because they throw more innings. They can, they can help you more. And uh, it, would, it would be tough for the Phillies unless they had a ready-made replacement to, uh, to move him there. But long term, you know, I, I don't want to say this because of, you know, for instance, what happened with Luis Severino with the Yankees. He, he certainly looked like a guy that needed to stay in the bullpen and then improved and, and became one of the best starters in baseball. I don't want to close the door completely, but at this point, to me, it looks like going to the bullpen might be the more uh, effective role for Vince Velasquez. Are there teams around baseball that might be interested in him in a trade? Like if the, if the Phillies went big game hunting in, in a trade, whether it's this trade deadline or next trade deadline, is he the kind of arm that another team would say, yeah, we, we, we would like that project? Um, at 26 and, and in the majors for, you know, as long as he's been, um, I think he's probably not the kind that, that a rebuilding team would want to go after, uh, or at least not their first choice, just because, you know, he's close to, um, or he may be already uh, at arbitration level. Um, that's that's one of those things that I think they want to avoid. I think teams want longer amounts of control. So at, at first glance, probably not. But um, it, it could be that you know if somebody sees something in him, you know, kind of kind of the Matt Harvey situation where the Reds saw in him, ah, here's somebody we think we can fix, or we see what his problem is um, that's making him inconsistent. Then that might be one of the ways that uh, that he might get traded somewhere else. You know the Phillies later this year may have Jared Eikhoff coming back to this team. We don't know the exact timetable right now, but you know, if he's back and ready to go, you know, how, how do you shuffle this rotation then? Because, you know, we know that they probably could use another starting pitcher, a left-hander. They might get one at the trade deadline. Arietta is struggled, but you can't kick him out of the rotation because how much you're paying him. And Eflin is pitching hot. Pavetta has had a very good year. And Aaron Nola is probably the second best pitcher in the national league. So, the only guy left really is Velasquez, but are you is can the Phillies really be confident that Eikhoff returning from an injury is the guy to stick in that last rotation spot, or could we see a scenario where both Velasquez and Eikhoff end up in the bullpen? Yeah, that's what as you were talking, that's that's what seemed like a more likely thing. I mean, what you want to do if especially if the playoffs are a possibility you you don't want to overtax your staff going down the stretch and uh, it may be possible i think i think we'll see more teams than uh, than we have in the past possibly go to that uh, you know six man rotation down the stretch mm -hmm. and he would be a guy that you would certainly maybe not want to have every fifth day but might throw him in as a spot starter just because you know coming back from the injury and everything there um, you don't want to overtax him too much. So, yeah, I don't know that you can you can count on a whole lot from Eikhoff, but if you do get him, he certainly gives you uh, some depth in that rotation to allow guys to maybe skip a start if they feel a twinge or something like that. Um, it would be a nice luxury to have if he could come back and, and be the kind of pitcher that I, I know the Phillies think that he will be. Phillies just finished that series with the Yankees. The Yankees leave Philadelphia. They go into their series now with the Boston Red Sox and – they did come out of there two out of three. So, you know, they did salvage a couple of wins in Philadelphia. But let me tell you, Steve, I'm I'm still worried about this pitching staff, the starting staff for the Yankees, because outside of Severino and Sabathia, I'm looking at the rest of this team between the injuries and the inconsistency. I don't think they have enough arms. I just don't. No, uh, I, don't, I don't think so either. And I think they'll be a player – in the, whatever a trade deadline sweepstakes there are, it, it's funny um, the, whether the uh, you know the Mets have kind of put some signals out there that they're thinking of, of, of possibly being open to trading a Degrom or a Syndergaard, but yet 
will they trade with the Yankees? Uh, I think that's an interesting question that I'm sure you've uh, batted around more than a few times on the show. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I think the Yankees will be looking at maybe somebody like a Cole Hamels, you know, a proven postseason performer who's having a decent year and the Rangers are going nowhere. Um, I, I think that the Yankees will be open to uh, to try and find somebody. It'll be tough, though, because to me it seems like outside of, um, you know, DeGrom and Syndergaard, you look at some of the big names that, that could be on the market in Jay Happ and Chris Archer, you know, both of those guys are AL East uh, on AL East teams. And, uh, and the Mets, you know, w- would they be willing to trade with the Yankees? So it, it, it's funny because the Yankees, with whatever resources that they have and a deep farm system if they need to go that far, may not have as many trade partners as, as some of the other teams looking for starting pitching. You mentioned DeGrom. How does the Sandy Alderson situation affect him being traded? Because, you know, without Alderson overseeing that front office, could that impact how the Mets pursue making a trade of DeGrom? That's a great question. Um, And honestly, I do not know. Uh, I don't know how they're going to divide up the responsibilities among uh, all the rest of the folks in the front office. Um, I mean, J.P. Ricciardi is probably, I guess, has the most experience in, in making making deals at this stage. Um, I honestly don't know. And uh, I think if, if you're the Mets, you have to listen to everybody, um, and you have to at least, you know, signal your interest in possibly trading DeGrom. He's, he's 30 years old, and um, if you're going to start rebuilding – it does take time, and, and we've seen with some of the other clubs that have, that have managed to do a successful rebuild, you need to get some of those top-level prospects. And I think DeGrom is, is basically the, the one guy on that team. I think they'd probably rather keep Syndergaard because he's younger. But, um, you know, they could get an awful lot of talent, um, multiple top prospects for him uh, from one of the contenders that, that need a, play, a pitcher like DeGrom to, to compete in the postseason. So, um, it's, it's honestly, it's, it's hard to say how the Mets are going to do their negotiations, but they at least have to be able to listen and, uh, and find a deal because that's what's, what's ultimately going to be best for the team. Excluding the Yankees and the Red Sox from this conversation, what are the teams that you think bring the most juice to the table for a potential DeGrom deal? I'll tell you what, the, the team that I keep looking at and, you know, the combination of a little bit of, of payroll flexibility, um, prospects in the farm system, and the desire to, to go out there and make a splash, I keep coming back to the Milwaukee Brewers. You know, this is a team that right now is in first place in the NL Central, a team that has already shown in its offseason dealings in getting Christian Yelich and Lorenzo Cain that they're willing to make moves for now rather than look down the road to the future. I think they're a team, and their farm system is very good. We just saw a guy uh, come up for the, from the minor leagues in Freddie Peralta and, and throw a gem this week. And, uh, you know, his first start in the major leagues, he struck out 13 in Colorado. I mean, that's the kind of high-ceiling talent that I think would be a good fit for the Mets. Certainly, they could use a guy like that. And the Brewers have a deep farm system, I, I think one of the better ones in all of Major League Baseball. So, in terms of uh, of teams that should be in on Jacob Degrom, um, I think Milwaukee is is at the top of my list. I would think. Yeah, Milwaukee's got a history of it. They got Sabathia back in two thousand eight. They got Greinke years ago. So uh, Milwaukee is no stranger to acquiring those pitchers, right, Steve? Exactly, exactly. And uh, you know, this is a team that hasn't really had a, uh, too much opportunity in the postseason in the recent past, and uh, it's. It's a city that's that's really hungry for that postseason baseball and uh, would not surprise me if they went out and, and made that big move. Speaking of pitchers, how does a former Met, Matt Harvey, fall into all of this potential trade discussion? I know that, you know, basically the Reds have him out there as kind of like an audition piece, right? So and he's pitched all right. He hasn't pitched great in Cincinnati, but he's pitched all right. Could he kind of be somebody's backup plan if they don't get any of the other names we mentioned? It's possible. Um, I, I think the thing, though, with, with acquiring somebody like Harvey is if you're a contender and you're going to get a starting pitcher, and, and, and Harvey has shown, at least from his, his public statements, that he doesn't want to work in the bullpen. 
So you'd need for him to be one of your top three starters, maybe four, to make a difference in the postseason. So, um, uh, yeah, he could, he could possibly help a team get to the playoffs. But when you're thinking beyond that and looking toward a postseason rotation, I, I just don't know if anybody can, can count on Matt Harvey to do that. And, and you mentioned you know, he's been better than he was with the Mets um, in a Cincinnati Reds uniform, but still – you're putting up an ERA in the fours, that's not a playoff caliber starter. So I don't know if if he's the kind of guy that, that could help a playoff contender. That said, you know, the, the Reds made that, um, made that move to try and possibly flip Harvey for somebody down the road. It, um, it could be possible that somebody could make a deal, but it wouldn't be, I don't think, uh, you know, a, a top prospect or anything like that coming back to the Reds. Steve, one more for you. Appreciate you joining us here on the Bulwark on the Hotline on 97.3 ESPN. Folks, follow him on Twitter at Steve A. Garner for all your baseball information year-round. Steve, I would say the four of the five best teams in all of baseball in the American League. It's the Astros, it's the Yankees, it's the Red Sox, and it's the Indians. Whatever order you want to shuffle them in, that's up to everybody's personal opinion. Of course, if you are fans, they're going to pick one team or the other. But who is the best team in the National League? Wow. Um, I think that's what makes this trade deadline so interesting because, you know, as we saw last year when the Astros acquired Justin Verlander, it changed things completely, especially the way that he pitched down the stretch. I think any of the teams, if they make a move right now, I would say I'd have to say it's probably the Brewers, um, but or maybe the Dodgers. I, I, see, I, I say one, and then I start, well, wait a minute. There's a, you know, the Dodgers getting Kershaw back, that's huge. Um, they could make a move and possibly get, you know, like, say, Manny Machado, throw them way to the, uh, to the favorites role. Um, I still I, I like the Brewers, what they have right now. And uh, if nobody makes any moves, they might be the favorite for me. But that's what's going to make this so exciting. You've got three teams in the NL East and the Braves, Phillies, and Nationals that are going to battle it out. You've got three teams in the Central and the Brewers, Cubs, and Cardinals that are going to battle it out. And, and in the West as well, the Diamondbacks, Dodgers, and, and don't uh, count the Giants out either. This, you know, this is such a toss-up right now and, and such a uh, polar opposite of, of what's going on in, in the American League. It's, um, it's really going to make for an interesting second half of the season. How's that for a cop-out answer? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let you slide this week, but I'll, I'll tell you who my pick is. I think it's the Diamondbacks. Yeah. I, I, they're, I like they're, I like their hitters. I like their lineup. Yeah, and you know Paul Goldschmidt really had such a, a slow start that now as he's kicking things back in, um, they're looking awfully fearsome. So uh, sitting on top of the West, you got to like their position at least right now. Yeah, I think I think they're one pitcher away. So, but hey, that's me. Everyone's got their pick, pick right, Steve. You know what I mean, with a lot of this stuff with the National League. You know, I know some people still look at the Cubs. Some people look at the the Braves even. But to me, the problem for the Braves is you know you want to see if they're sustainable with the Cubs. You know, you feel like you know you want to see guys like Schwarber actually hit a little bit more consistently. And you know, you have the teams hanging around like the Dodgers and the Cardinals who are kind of keeping it interesting. But I thought it was interesting what you said earlier about the Brewers that they could go out and acquire a pitcher if they make those acquisitions. You know, we could also say the Brewers are the best team in the NL. Yep, exactly, and uh, yeah, that's that's what's going to make it so fascinating. There are a lot of teams in the American League that are in sell mode, and um, some excellent talent that's out there. That uh, it definitely could shape the, the the course of of the rest of the season in the National League uh, tremendously. He's Steve Gardner joining us on the Boardwalk on the Hotline on ninety seven three ESPN. His weekly appearance show on Middays with Q on ninety seven three ESPN. Follow him on Twitter at Steve A. Gardner. Check out all of his work writing about baseball for USA Today. Steve, appreciate the time on a Thursday, and we'll catch you next week. You bet. Thanks so much.